Good morning, everyone. Today we are um, fortunate, to have, fortunate to have Professor Jeff Karp from uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital, Harvard Medical School, to give our uh, Teresaki talk series. He's a professor of anesthesia at Brigham and Women's Hospital. He has published over 125 papers, 20,000 citations, given over 300 invited lectures. He has more than 100 issued or pending patents. Many technologies from his lab have led to multiple products going, undergoing clinical dev development on the market. And for the, he's launched nine companies, which has raised over $450 million. His lab has been funded by NIH, NFL, DOD, Kenneth Rainin Foundation, uh, Rheumatology Research Foundation, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Sanofi, and Leo Pharma. He's received over 50 awards and honors. Boston Magazine recently recognized Carp as one of the 11 Boston doctors making medical breakthroughs. His work has been selected by Popular Mechanics, <coughs> one of the top 20 new biotech breakthroughs that will change medicine. He gave a TED Med talk on bio-inspired medical innovation, a TEDx talk on radical simplicity, and was a commencement speaker at the University of Toronto. We're fortunate to have Jeff. Jeff, please. Go ahead. Super. Well, thank you so much. Does everything look okay? Can you see me? But Jeff, I, I think I accidentally turned off your video, so just please turn that on again. Okay. Okay. Hold on. Let me see here. Um, how do I do that? Oh, wait. Start, there we go. Start video. Okay, cool. Go. No problem. Um, <clears throat> well, thank you so much, Mehmet, and for the nice introduction, and, and Ali, that, you know, thanks for inviting me today. Um, and uh, what I thought I would do is, is um, share with you some of the, um, the process um, that I have been um, kind of iterating over time um, to establish my laboratory and as well to try to maximize the potential for what we do um, to uh, make it out into society to actually help patients. And, um, <clears throat> you know, it's really this, this, this kind of realization um, that, uh, you know, I train with um, really incredible uh, investigators, very entrepreneurial. Um, but as I was coming out of my um, postdoc um, to starting my faculty position and really excited about um, the potential of, of um, discovering new um, science, as well as developing new technologies, um, I realized that I, I really hadn't participated in the translational process. And um, I really wanted to figure out a way to establish my lab to maximize translation. And so I had to um, really dig deep and develop um, significant self-awareness of the processes that go on in my mind and other people's minds and really try to um, figure out um, you know, how I was going to structure my laboratory to achieve this goal. So I wanted to share with you just some thoughts about how I have gone about um, starting my lab and, and what I think is really important. And then also um, how I've tried to um, implement certain strategies to maximize translation. So before I get going, um, I just wanted to disclose um, my conflicts of interest um, for which I have many. Um, <clears throat> so I've started a number of companies. I continue to consult for those companies uh, and I hold equity in those companies. So, um, you know, it's often said that, that um, you know, the strength of an organization is really the people and, um, <clears throat> and it's all about the people and this, this, you know, couldn't be more true. But one challenge that, that I saw, um, you know, in structuring my laboratory was how to um, choose the right people uh, to join the lab. And, um, and so, you know, I read a lot of articles on this and sort of just had a lot of discussions with colleagues. And I think, you know, what I saw as being very important was to um, find ways to bring people to the lab who are really excited about changing the world. They're just driven to do it. Um, and, you know, very friendly people who get along well with others. Um, <clears throat> so that was, you know, that was kind of key to be, to start thinking about that. 
Um, but I realized over time that I wasn't necessarily the best judge of who would fit into the lab. I kind of saw myself wanting to hire everybody um, and, you know, giving everybody a chance, really seeing that, that everyone has incredible potential. And, um, but, but, you know, you only have limited funding and, and you have to make decisions. Um, and what I realized over time was that um, people in my laboratory who I would involve in the process um, were quite good at this. And so what I did was, is I, I sort of implemented this structure where um, I have a certain group of people in the lab who will interview everyone who comes in. Um, and, and even more than that, um, they can veto me. So if I say, you know, we should really bring this person into the lab, um, they can say no, and the answer will be no, or, you know, or the opposite. Um, you know, I could say no, and they could say yes. Um, and the reason why I think that's so important is because um, we really want to bring people to the lab who are, um, who, who others don't feel um, competitive with. Um, where there's likely not going to be any sort of, you know, personality mismatches. Um, if the people in the lab are heavily involved in the process, um, you know, they're likely to pick someone who's going to elevate their science, um, someone who they're going to be able to create synergies with um, and get along with, and, and someone who they're going to be excited, you know, when, they, when this person, you know, joins. Um, and so I found that to be, you know, very important. And another thing is I read this article once about how when you're hiring, you typically try to hire yourself. Um, and, you know, it's interesting because after I read that article, I started realizing that um, as I was asking questions, I was actually trying to hire myself. So I think, you know, developing that kind of awareness um, uh, has been really important and, and figuring out people in the lab who are really good judge of character and who might fit, uh, making sure they're involved in, in all um, key decisions. Another um, <clears throat> thing that, that, that I think is really important um, is to try to find ways to empower people um, in the lab. And, uh, and, and I'll give you an example um, of this. Um, so I had this uh, student, Ben Mead, who joined the lab um, several years ago. Uh, he just graduated, I think it was uh, about a year and a half or two years ago. And uh, in his first year of his PhD, he said, you know, I'd really like to write grants. Um, so we wrote a number of grants and um, three of them got funded. <clears throat> so then he said, okay, well, what do we do next? And I said, you, you know, you need to hire um, a team of people. So I helped him to hire some people. And so in his second year of his PhD, he had three full-time people working in the lab who were reporting directly to him. And then this allowed him to really spread his wings very quickly um, develop his mentorship skills and, and, you know, all kinds of other skills. And then another thing I did was that when um, it came time to present or, you know, do some of the updates, there was a foundation that we had gotten funding from, and they invited me to go speak to the board. And so what I did was, um, I knew if I asked, you know, could Ben join me, they would likely say no. So I just brought him into the room with me. Um, and then I presented the first few slides, just gave a bit of an overview. Um, and handed it over to Ben, and he presented the majority of the presentation. And later on at the um, reception, you know, people from the board were coming up to to me and to Ben, and 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 just you know really excited about um, what uh, what we had presented, and very impressed by by Ben. And I think these sort of um, opportunities for empowerment can really maximize um, fulfillment. Can really um, provide significant validation, can build confidence, and, um, you know, just can be really helpful for people to spread their wings and, and really, you know, unleash their potential. And so that's something that, that I found to be very um, important. Another thing is, I mean, we can never really provide access to unlimited resources, but if you kind of set a goal of, of really trying to get there, um, I think this can be extremely helpful. And so, for example, I have a number of affiliations in Boston, um, you know, at the Broad and the Harvard Stem Cell Institute and, and, and other places. And I really see those as access to resources. It kind of gets our foot in the door um, to more quickly start collaborations or to access certain tools or core facilities. Um, and then, of course, you know, we're always um, writing grant proposals. And to me, that's just really important because, again, it's, the, it's about empowering the people in the lab and minimizing potential um, limitations. 
um, it also makes it a lot easier to, to um, start new projects, especially ones where we're just um, sort of, um, you know, doing some early work to test whether something may be feasible or not. Um, the, the fewer limitations we have, the more quickly we can kind of run those types of experiments. Um, <clears throat> and then I've also found that, um, you know, having a multidisciplinary lab has been very important. Um, and um, for a number of reasons, one is I kind of envision, you know, let's say we're sitting around a table, maybe there's 10 or 15 people at the table and, um, you know, we're brainstorming a challenge that we face. Um, I think if everyone at that table can provide a unique perspective that others can't, immediately when they speak um, and they're heard, they become validated. You know, there, there minimizes competition um, and people are more likely to go all in. And then you also have access to all the tools and resources and knowledge in these various fields. Um, and so we've had people like all kinds of engineers and biologists. We've had a gastrointestinal surgeon, a cardiac surgeon, multiple MDs, a dentist. Um, so I think that kind of diversity has been important. And then I also think multicultural diversity is, is, is very important um, because people have different you know, education systems, meaning that they think differently. Um, and when we're trying to solve problems, you know, we want to we wanna approach them from different angles. And then also, you know, we tend to become most familiar with the problems that we learn about in our backyard. So you know, we're in the United States, and so we may be more likely to learn about problems that face United States citizens. Um, but if you have people from other countries, you know, they can bring up um, problems that the people in their home country face. And so this then, you know, sort of opens our eyes um, to other problems that we may um, be able to, uh, to help with. Um, and then anyone who joins my lab, I like to commit to being a mentor for life. Um, and, um, and this to me is, is just really important. It, it, it is, um, you know, provides, um, it just, you know, makes people feel comforted. It, you know, makes them feel supported. Um, and, you know, so, so anyone who, who leaves the lab, um, you know, still like will, um, you know, write letters or review grants or papers or have conversations, you know, always looking for ways to, to help other people. Um, and, um, and a lot of this actually I learned from, from Ali, um, who uh, has not only been a great friend um, for several years, we actually met um, in uh, uh, first year of grad school at University of Toronto. Um, and then uh, Ali went to MIT, actually, I stayed at University of Toronto to finish my PhD. He did his PhD in Bob Langer's lab. And then, um, uh, and then I kind of followed in Ali's footsteps going to, uh, uh, to MIT Bob Langer's lab. Ali actually helped me get into the lab um, and then um, started my faculty position at the Brigham after Ali had done that and he helped me get that position as well. Um, so I've learned a tremendous amount from from Ali and just has been an incredible mentor to so many, so many people. Um, and I think that that's just, it, it's really important to have a mentorship strategy um, and to constantly be, um, you know, um, thinking about it and iterating um, and looking for ways to, uh, to improve and, and refine. So just maybe a little bit about the translational uh, strategy of the lab. Um, so <clears throat> one of the things that I think is, is really critical when starting a project is I, I think we kind of tend to, in the biomedical community, jump into technologies um, too quickly. Um, it's a lot of fun to develop a new technology. Um, and I think that um, often what we miss is that um, the problems that we're trying to solve may actually not been defined in a way that makes them solvable. Um, and I think it's really important um, to um, sort of try to stop our brainstorming technology development sort of excitement, you know, all that, you know, the way our minds tend to gravitate towards that to kind of, you know, put that on pause initially and really focus on um, problem definition. And one of the ways I like to kind of look at this is to go into a problem and almost, um, you know, pretend, you know, convince yourself that people before you have not defined the problem the right way. Um, and I think this is a good thought exercise because that, then you put on your detective hat and you go in and you really test the assumptions, you really think through um, the definition that others have created. And, and I think by doing that, you often will find things that are questionable 
um, that can then lead you to specific early experiments to perform where you can gain some critical insights. Um, and, um, and then those insights often can direct you towards a technology um, which could be differentiated. And, and um, so, so to me, it's, it's just really important to try to identify early on insights that others may have missed or overlooked. Um, <clears throat> another thing that I think is really important um, and really you know, is critical to translational um, science is, um, and this is something I like to ask pretty much like every lab meeting, which is what's the bar that we need to exceed to get everybody excited? Um, what's the best result that anyone has ever achieved in a particular model and how much better do we need to do um, uh, for us to claim success? And it's a very difficult question to answer, but I feel like the more times we ask this and think about it, um, the greater chance we will um, uh, achieve impact and maximize that uh, that impact. So, you know, just one example could be, you know, maybe we're developing a new um, technology in, in the field of cancer and, you know, we look to a particular animal model and we look to what's the best survival that's been ever achieved and, and how much better do we need to do, you know, how much longer does the animal need to survive or or, you know, just kind of thinking about things like that and think because that what it also does is it also helps us focus on um, the uh, the models that we need to test our, our, our strategies. Um, another thing that I found which is really important is um, to apply translational filters. Um, and so, you know, and, and, and I'll explain this. So when I was coming out of my um, my postdoc, um, what I found was that, um, you know, as I kind of mentioned before, I, I really didn't sort of know how to translate. And so what I did is I made a commitment um, and probably one of the most important decisions I've ever made, I think, um, in my career. So I made a commitment to meet someone new in the translational ecosystem every two or three weeks, be it a patent lawyer, a corporate lawyer, reimbursement, regulatory expert, um, you know, entrepreneurs, people in companies, and not just meet people, but actually form relationships with them. Um, and, um, and through this process, as we're advancing through, um, you know, along um, our projects, um, I'm constantly reaching out to people I know in the community and asking them questions about, you know, can this be manufactured? Or do you think investors would invest in this? Or what do you think the best first application might be? You know, really asking um, translationally focused questions. And then I'm trying to steer the projects in the lab um, as I'm learning, um, you know, along the way. So that, that's been very critical. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, I once read this, this article um, by Pixar um, and it was called um, Going from Suck to Non-Suck. Um, and, you know, Pixar makes some of the best animated films, um, you know, that have ever been created. And it really talked about how important it was um, where they initially, when they were making their movies, they would make them and have like a, you know, final, a first kind of draft. <clears throat> and then they would show it to people and, and, and every one of their test audiences would hate it um, and for, be super critical. And so what they did is they changed their model so that they engage the test audiences the entire way through. And I think we should be doing the same thing. Often when we're going along in projects, there's blind spots there's things that we miss uh, because of lack of certain expertise or way of we're thinking about things or we're just too enamored with the technologies that we're developing. Um, and so I think it's just critical to find people who are external to um, you know, the laboratory who can provide critical feedback and keep us on the right track. And the other thing that I found um, is really important is <clears throat> to, to try and publish in the best journals that we can. I know there's a lot of debate around, you know, impact factors and, you know, there's a lot of incredible papers that have been published in low impact factor journals, but, um, you know, we need to make decisions. And one of the decisions that I made is that we're going to try to publish in the highest impact journals that we can. Um, and the reason why I think this is important is because often you know generates more interest and more likely to get a press release and if we can get a press release on 
um, our publications, then, you know, the word gets out and, you know, we've had all kinds of entrepreneurs and companies reach out to the lab because they've seen something, you know, in a, in a press release. And then the other is to find, try and find an entrepreneur um, who we can partner with um, to then, you know, help pull the technology out of the lab and, and into um, a company. And one of the things that I've, I've um, think is really critical about that strategy that I mentioned of meeting people in the community um, is that I've gotten to meet a lot of um, entrepreneurs. Um, so, you know, people who, um, you know, have started companies before, people who have a lot of relationships in the community. And, um, and, and um, you know, I found that that's actually one of the most difficult things to, to um, advancing translation is um, finding, um, you know, if often what I've seen is that, and I used to do this too, is you get to almost the end of a project and then you start looking for an entrepreneur to do something with, but these are very relationship driven um, things. And, 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 and so by forming relationships with entrepreneurs and the community, um, you know, this, and, 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 and then when, I'm, as a project's advancing, I'm actually interacting with some of these entrepreneurs. And so often by the time, you know, we're, we're published our work and, you know, things are, are looking promising. Um, I'm already, you know, discussing this with a number of people in the community asking if they're available or if they know someone's available. And to me, you know, an exceptional entrepreneur is someone who can um, help to raise money. And as well, they have like a, a, a very diverse network of people who um, are eager to work with them again. Um, such as, you know, reimbursement or regulatory experts or patent experts, um, and, uh, you know, manufacturing experts, etc. cetera. Um, and so, um, and, and so, so I also thought, you know, I would just put up this slide to, to talk a little bit about why I think that we often fail to translate. And um, you'll see here, I have number one twice, and that's on purpose. Um, I, I think this has been a really big challenge in, in academia. You know, there's um, a lot of excitement about what we're doing, but so few things that we actually work on ever make it um, into society to help other people. And one of the reasons why, I, and I think there's several, but one of them I think is that we actually think often that we're doing translational work, but we're actually doing basic science. And, um, and another way of saying this is that I think that we don't, we don't define the problems the right way. Now, we need basic science before we can translate something. So basic science is absolutely critical. Um, but if we're trying to advance and, and develop a technology that has a chance of helping somebody, we need to define the problems a different way. And I think very often um, what we do in academia is we define maybe the clinical problem or we define the science problem, the biological problem. But what we fail to do, and I think this needs to be done very early in projects, is think about the patent problem, the manufacturing problem, the regulatory problem, the investment problem, the sales problem. You know, so often when we're developing technologies, I think there's been huge number of very promising technologies, but haven't helped patients because you can't manufacture it. So right at the beginning of projects, we're asking questions like, you know, can this be manufactured? How can we simplify the technology so that um, to minimize the number of steps, so we minimize the number of quality control points during manufacturing, just as an example, or can we choose materials that are readily available, maybe even GMP um, quality? So that could help. Um, early on, we're looking, you know, through patents on Google patents and trying to get a sense for is what we're advancing on patentable. Um, because often if you can't get a patent, um, you're not going to be able to help people. Um, also, the regulatory problem, you know, what are we going to need to compare our technology to in a clinical trial? Because we want that comparator, we want to include it as early as possible in our work. Um, so, you know, often in academia, we show these, you know, bar graphs where we show like control is here and then our experimental group is way up here. Um, and, you know, massively, massive difference, statistical significance. But what we fail to ask is, is that result actually important? And a lot of the time it actually is, is not important because if you take the clinical gold standard that is being used and you put it on the graph, it ends up doing much better than our experimental group. And so that tells us that we haven't pushed this technology far enough along 
um, to really show that we can make a meaningful difference. And I think that's what we need to, to focus on. And also, you know, we need to know whether something is going to be able to excite investors. Um, you know, is it an overcrowded space? Is it, um, you know, a new market? And, you know, we have to really think about these things early and throughout the entire um, trajectory of the project, I think, to maximize potential for us to, um, to to translate and then also um you know we need to figure out like who's going to be buying this technology and what are they currently buying and and how how will what we're doing actually incentivize them to pick our technology versus another one and again this kind of comes back to what's the bar we need to exceed to get everybody excited so i think the key here really in in translating um, um science is that we need to define the problem very broadly um, and include a lot of these. And there's other things I haven't put on this list, but just to give you an idea of, of the type of thinking that, that we often do. So what I thought I'd do is just share with you uh, a few quick examples from my laboratory on projects um, that started as ideas and now are advancing towards um, translation. So uh, this is Dr. Um, Del Nido. Um, he's a chief of cardiac surgery at um, Boston Children's Hospital, and he contacted me about 10 years ago about a problem that he faces in the clinic, um, which is septal defects. So these are holes in between the chambers of the heart. Um, and he said, you know, sometimes what happens is, is that um, when he goes to, um, to fix these, the tissue is so fragile, it just tears. And... Um, there's devices that work in adults, but you can't simply downsize them because these are permanent materials. And as the um, heart is growing, it just outgrows the implant. So um, we were interested in developing a new approach um, that could close these holes and, and would work over the long term. And so we came up with this concept that we would develop a, a patch um, that would have a thin layer of a glue on it. We'd put it inside the heart push it up against um, the hole, the surrounding area around the hole, it would immediately attach um, and, um, and close the hole. Uh, and then cells would migrate on top of it, form new tissue, uh, and then this material would degrade and the patient would be left with their own tissue sealing this hole. And so um, as we started to think more and more about this, we realized that this was uh, probably the most challenging project that we had ever worked on um, one is that, you know, the blood is rushing against the, um, the, you know, 60 beats per minute. So we can delaminate the material. There's the, um, expansion and contraction. So that can also delaminate, um, and also clearly very wet environment, lots of proteins present. Um, and it's, you know, most biomaterials would just be quickly fouled in the presence of, of blood and not be able to stick um, to the tissue, let alone every surface in the heart is, is covered with a, lay, a layer of blood. So we started to advance um, on some ideas and then we quickly hit a wall and um, we just we couldn't figure out a way around it and we tried something it didn't work we tried something it didn't work um over and over again and this happens so often in, in our our projects um where you know a challenge arises and we approach it um and we fail to to make headway and then we step back we rethink it or, or at least we think we do we then apply the same thinking um, we approach again and of course we get the the same outcome even though we're expecting a different outcome um, so what I thought I'd do is just kind of emphasize this point with the following um, example. So this is a problem that really happened in Europe, where you can see a car here has fallen into the water. We have the problem solvers that are lined up, um, and they chose to bring in a crane, probably had a few different options, but uh, this seemed reasonable. Uh, and things seem to be going well uh, until the following happens. So one problem has become two problems and the second problem is bigger than the first. So the question is, what are the problem solvers going to do next? And the answer is, they're gonna do the same thing that all of us would do, which is bring in a bigger crane. And what do you think happens? The same thing. So I think the challenge for all of us is how do we break free from this repetitive thinking that we typically do, these low energy brain states that our minds tend to gravitate towards, um, where we really don't um, 
you know, where, where we, we have like minimal creativity going on. How do we get into these higher energy brain states where we can really activate our minds to bring in a constant supply of new ideas and really break free from this repetitive thinking? And um, one of the ways, I think there's many ways to do this, but one of the ways that we've tried to do this is to turn to nature for inspiration. So it's this idea that every living creature around us, plant or animal, um, is here because it has solved an incredible number of problems. And creatures that can't solve problems quickly become extinct. Um, so in essence, we're surrounded by solutions, which I see as um, ideas for solving problems. And all we need to do is turn to the literature um, to see some of the mechanisms that have been elucidated in nature. And then we can bring these back into the laboratory um, to potentially uh, help us move in different directions or new directions. And so we asked the question, well, what creatures exist within wet dynamic um, environments? Um, and um, <clears throat> we looked at a bunch of creatures and we focused in on sandcastle worms that exist in the sea. Um, they sit on top of rocks and waves are hitting them and they're not moving. And then there's slugs and snails, which, um, you know, sometimes you'll see a snail sitting on a leaf and it's raining and it's not moving. Or sometimes it's walking across the ground and there's kind of like a goo behind it. So what we notice is that these creatures that exist within wet dynamic environments um, have a couple things in common. Um, one is they have viscous secretions. And we thought that was interesting um, because things that are viscous have inherent adhesive interactions with their substrate. So if I put honey, for example, on a table and then I try to wash it away, um, it will stay there for a period of time. And we thought that might be useful because um, when we have a patch, if we have a thin layer of glue on it, we make that glue viscous. When the clinician puts that down onto the tissue, they may not get it in the right spot right away. They might need to move it around. Um, and having some viscosity may just help, help them keep it there um, before they move to a, a final um, secured state. And we develop a lot of light activatable materials. And so we thought, okay, we'll make it a light activatable um, glue so we could then, once it's in the right location, we'll shine light and we'll cure it to its final state. Another thing we notice is that these viscous secretions also contain hydrophobic agents and things that are hydrophobic um, can repel water. And so we thought, okay, well, maybe this is a way to get rid of um, the blood at the surface of the tissue. If we make that glue hydrophobic, we put it in, um, then we'll be able to repel the blood away and get intimate contact of the glue um, with the tissue. And this was important because most of the tissue adhesives that were being developed at the time were hydrophilic to mimic the properties in the body, but this was telling us, well, maybe to, to kind of target this key design criteria of the problem um, to address the blood at the surface of the tissue, having a hydrophobic glue um, could be quite helpful. So this um, was great, but it didn't tell us how to achieve strong levels of adhesion. And so for this, we turned to ivy, and ivy um, is really incredible in terms of the amount of force required to remove ivy from uh, a surface. Um, I don't know how many people have ever tried to do it. I have, and it, it just requires a significant amount of force. So the mechanism had uh, been elucidated about 10 years ago or so, um, and ivy has these um, root hairs that um, go up and down uh, surface uh, almost like a heat-seeking missile, and it's looking for crevices to insert into. And when it finds those crevices, it secretes a glue, um, and then it dries up and mechanically interlocks. Um, and so we started thinking, well, if we could get, as soon as we put the glue on tissue, if we could get it to infiltrate into the tissue very quickly, well, then um, light can go into tissue often tens of microns, maybe 50 microns, maybe a maximum about 100 microns. And that might be enough to then cure the glue in the tissue and achieve mechanical interlock. Um, and so there's no recipe for doing this. We just really, it was brute force. We had to try lots and lots of different formulations, but eventually we found something that worked um, where we could take the glue, put it on tissue, um, cure it. And in this case, we immediately freeze fractured it. This was on heart tissue. And you can see here at the top, we have the adhesive. Um, and then underneath, we have the collagen fibers um, in the tissue. And you can see the glue is interdigitated in between um, the fibers. And then when we cure it, it just locks into place. So it's almost like a tissue-like Velcro. 
And this would then make it um, you know, be adhesive to almost any tissue uh, in the body. And so I want to advance to one of the most um, challenging experiments that we've ever performed in the lab. And we did a, a number of experiments um, where what we did is we um, made an incision in here in the myocardium. This was done in Dr. Del Nido's lab. Um, and then we had our adhesive patch on the um, end of this device, um, which was referred to a cardioport device. We then pushed this against the septum um, inside a, a pig heart, actually had two pigs, um, cured it uh, for about 20 seconds, removed this, uh, sutured the myocardium. And um, here's what it looked like right after the procedure. Um, so you can see a patch here on the left and one on the right, two separate pigs, uh, 82 beats per minute. Um, so we're pretty excited that the patch could attach. Um, and then uh, we uh, came back at four hours, administered epinephrine, um, to increase the heart rate to see if it would remain uh, attached. And you can see here 165 beats per minute. The patch remained attached here on the left and um, on the pig on the right here. Um, and then we came back after 24 hours um, and the patch was still there. You can see um, some uh, um, uh, suture that's here, which is part of the deployment mechanism. And you can see this um, uh, you know, blood clotting that's happening on top of it. Uh, and so while this is, you know, very early time point and, you know, still a long way to go, we were really excited about this because, you know, there's a lot of beats of the heart um, within those 24 hours. And um, to our knowledge, this was really the first time um, that anyone had showed that you could actually attach something inside um, the heart without using mechanical fixation like sutures or staples, for example. Um, so just to pause here for a moment, I want to highlight two individuals on this project. Um, so Maria um, was a grad student from the MIT Portugal program who was in my laboratory, a material scientist. And Nora um, uh, is a cardiac surgeon from Germany um, who was in Dr. Del Nido's lab. And the two of them got along really well um, and provided you know, very different perspectives and different um, skill sets and knowledge in this project. Um, and um, they ended up being the uh, co-first author on the, the paper that we published um, based on this, this work. So <clears throat> you'll notice that we had to um, uh, create a hole, to seal a hole. We had to make a, a hole in the myocardium to get this into the septum. So we wanted to see if we could develop an interventional procedure um, to see could we deploy this patch from a distant site through a blood vessel. And I just want to show you this um, short video showing how we went about that um, project. So um, I just realized the sound is coming out of my headphones. So I'll, I'll just walk you through it. Um, so essentially what we did here is um, we developed a catheter. Um, this is with Connor Walsh's lab at the Beast Institute. Um, and Ellen Roach who was in Connor's lab at the time, now at uh, faculty at MIT. Um, and so we developed this uh, double balloon system. See the patch actually deploys first and then the balloon is um, in front of it. We have a balloon on the other side so we can apply force. Um, we then have a metallic coating on the balloon. So we shine the light. Light always you know, goes in the direction you're shining it. So we're able to reflect the light backwards through the transparent patch to activate the glue that faces the tissue. Um, and then we can pull the catheter through this patch leaving a small hole. Um, and then the uh, tissue can grow over top of it and then the material can degrade. Um, and the clinicians told us that it was okay to leave behind um, a small hole like that because it, small holes in the heart can actually self seal. So we actually built the device and we demonstrated that it could work um, in several um, models. And, uh, and recognizing the challenges that still lay ahead to develop a patch to seal holes inside a beating heart, um, and we um, decided to keep that project in the academic setting, but because the glue itself could actually seal the carotid artery of a pig, the aorta of a pig, um, and, and, be, and could attach to many other tissues, we started this company called Tissium, um, based in Paris, and um, the company received regulatory approval in Europe for vascular reconstruction, um, and just got the go-ahead from the FDA um, in the U.S. to start a, uh, um, the trial. And this goes far beyond the adhesives. Um, we also need to develop devices to, to deploy this adhesive in the body. And so uh, the company has developed all kinds of adhesive um, uh, delivery technologies. On the left, you can see it being sprayed on. 
In the middle, it's being applied under a, a vacuum assisted system in a water tank, so we can apply to wet tissue. And then on the right, um, through small trocars or probes in, in, a, in a minimally invasive fashion. Um, and then we also added a blue dye so that we could see where this glue was being applied. And on the left, you can see uh, the light applicator, um, which is LED light. In the lab, we use UV light, um, but we've switched uh, since then to, uh, to LED, which is, which is much uh, safer and, and easier, easier to deploy. So just a, a couple other um, quick things I wanted to share with you, other projects um, that are currently in the process of, of translation. One of the problems that we've been working on is a um, delivering drugs to the back of the eye. And um, this has been, you know, a, a huge problem um, uh, that faces society for diseases like macular degeneration and diabetic retinopathy, star guards, there's a lot of diseases. Um, and the challenge is, is if you just inject drugs into the vitreous, um, often you can't get the drugs to diffuse and, and be as high, in high enough concentration at the back of the eye. Um, so it only works for a very limited number of drugs. Um, there's also procedures um, where you stick probes through the eye to the back of the eye in the context of gene therapy, and then you lift up the retina in a small location and you inject um, drugs there. Um, and this can be very effective, although the problem is it's very challenging to perform, um, so it can only be performed in certain centers um, around the world, and you only transfect a small amount of the, uh, the macula. Um, so we were interested in, in seeing if we could develop a technology that would be able to target the entire um, uh, area at the back of the eye. And for this, we uh, developed a needle, and we made use of a principle that um, there's layers of the eye, um, and so you have the outer layers, the sclera, and the next layer is the choroid, and it's almost like a, a balloon inside of a balloon where the inner balloon is pushing on the outer one, but they're not attached. And, um, and if you inject, let's say you put a needle in between those two layers and you inject, it'll go all the way around. Um, and, um, and so there had been needles that had been developed that are specific length to try to target this suprachoroidal space. It's a potential space. Um, and uh, it can work well, but the problem is, is that people have different um, uh, thicknesses of their sclera. And with a fixed needle, you may not actually get it directly into um, this, uh, this space. And so we developed a needle um, whereby it made use of um, the force that was sensed at the tip of the needle. Um, so when the needle is in the sclera and you're pushing on the, the syringe, uh, the fluid can't come out because the tip of the needle is, is blocked. Um, but as you're going through and exit the sclera into the suprachoroidal space, the fluid immediately comes out because you have a, a big drop in the resistance. Um, and that's the mechanism that we use to then deliver drugs uh, uh, all the way around the, the back of the eye. And we showed we could deliver cells as well as microparticles um, and uh, a bunch of different um, drugs. And so we started this company called Bullseye Therapeutics, um, which is in the process of bringing this forward um, to the clinic. And then um, finally, um, uh, I want to share with you some of the work that we've been doing in the area of hearing loss. It's a massive societal problem. Um, you know, hundreds of millions of people right now on the planet have significant hearing loss, and all we have really are hearing aids um, and cochlear implants, um, which have been incredibly beneficial to a lot of people, uh, but they have uh, significant limitations. And so we were interested in seeing if we could develop small molecules um, that could be injected into the middle ear and then diffuse across the round window membrane into the inner ear, which is the cochlea, where we have um, uh, hair cells. And these hair cells, and, and to try to regenerate them, um, <clears throat> these hair cells are, are incredibly precious um, cells and they never ever regenerate um, uh, you know, from the time that we're born. Um, we're only born with about 15,000 per inner ear. And um, just the aging process, uh, you know, can, can kill these cells. So over time, these cells will just naturally die. Um, so you have less and less. And then a number of drugs can kill these cells, um, so certain types of antibiotics or chemotherapeutics. And then if we're exposed to loud noises, generally anything over 80 decibel, decibels for a couple hours can induce um, permanent um, hearing loss. In fact, you can get an app um, for your phone where you, it can create, you know, it's a decibel meter, you can tell, you know, so if you're on an airplane, for example, it's usually above 80 decibels. And so if you fly a lot, 
um, you're at great risk for developing hearing loss. So all the flight attendants and pilots all have um, uh, hearing loss, you know, if they've been flying for a while. Um, and, uh, and, and there's no approaches um, to regenerate these cells. There's progenitor cells that exist in the inner ear, but those progenitor cells never um, divide. And so what we did is we identified um, small molecules that could proliferate those progenitor cells. Um, and then those progenitor cells, once they proliferate, were able to produce new um, hair cells. Um, <clears throat> we were inspired by um, birds and amphibians, um, uh, like frogs and toads, because they can regenerate their hearing throughout life. Um, and, um, but humans, unfortunately, we just don't have this, this capability. So the small molecule cocktail we were able to show could produce um, many new hair cells. And you can see that here. This is from one of the um, culture dishes from our experiment where the blue are the, the hair cells and the pink are the um, stereocilia. So it's not actually real hair. Um, it's, it's actually stereocilia that move in response to sound waves and then the cell converts that to an electrical signal that gets sent to the, the brain. So we started the company based on this called Frequency Therapeutics um, in 2015. Um, and the company is now undergoing a, um, a clinical trial in the United States. Um, last year uh, in April, the company reported um, some early results from their trial showing that people who had stable hearing loss for months and months, their hearing um, improved. Um, so really excited by that. Um, and then this led to a partnership with Astellis um, uh, for XUS rights uh, to bring that therapy uh, to market once it passes trials and to also help, help get through the, those trials. Um, and then in October, we um, IPO'd the company on um, the NASDAQ and it was really awesome to, to have the entire team um, in New York, um, right in Times Square and, and um, was quite a over the top uh, experience. Um, and then recently, the company announced that uh, a number of patients whose hearing improved um, from that early time point, um, this was actually sustained for many months. Um, and so while we're still early here um, in the process and lots to learn and lots to explore, um, you know, we're, we're excited and, and a, uh, about um, you know, what, what uh, has yet to come. And, and uh, in uh, next year, the results from the phase two trial um, will be released. Um, so maybe just in the interest of time, I should probably, just to save some room for questions, um, I, do ha I did have another project uh, that I was gonna go through, but uh, maybe in the interest of time, I'll just flip through here um, to a summary slide. Um, and I just want to summarize by saying that, um, you know, we try to develop tools in the laboratory and, and take advantage of tools that can help us to improve our, um, our thinking um, to constantly bring in new ideas, um, you know, kind of this sense that, you know, we exist in these um, structures, these buildings, we're actually kind of over time, we're getting further and further away from nature. And I think that's reducing our um, creativity and, um, and, and, and sort of minimizing our ability to um, explore our curiosities. And I think so turning to nature for inspiration can, can really help um, to bring in new ideas. We, we're often not trying to mimic nature directly, but rather take a basic idea in nature and then improve on it for our own purposes. So once we have a defined problem um, and we try to solve it and encounter a barrier, that's when we often will turn to nature to see if we can um, uh, come up with some new ideas that we wouldn't otherwise have, have, have thought of. And then the other concept that I think is just really critical for translation is radical simplicity. And to me, you know, this is really about thinking, thinking about the problem, not just as a clinical problem or a biology problem, but thinking about a lot of the different translational, um, you know, things that need to get done, like manufacturing and, and regulatory and, and investments and patents and, and thinking about that early and then simplifying every possible way you can, because I've just, I've seen some of the things we develop um, as well as, as others um, just fail to get translated because they're too complicated. I think in academia, there's this tendency to focus on, you know, it, the more complex something is and we can achieve it, um, the higher impact journal we can get our work into. Um, 
but then we reduce our potential to actually help anybody. And so we really want to be careful about, um, I think, you know, minimizing that complexity. Sometimes we need some complexity, um, which is fine, but we want to minimize it at every possible angle we can um, to maximize the potential for what we are spending, you know, so much time developing and, and really pouring our hearts into, um, we'll have a chance of, of uh, helping people and benefiting society. So at this time, I just want to thank you for your attention. I want to thank my funding sources and all the incredible people in the laboratory um, whose work I've presented today and happy to take any questions. Thank, thanks so much. Hi, Jeff. Thank you for the, the, the great talk. So a couple of questions came in. Uh, when the material degrades inside, where does the waste products go? The waste products form uh, for the, sorry, I missed the first part because I might had tr I turned my volume off for that. Uh, yeah, video. when the material is degrading inside the body, where does the waste products go? Oh, yeah, so the, um, you're talking about the glue that we developed? Yes. Yeah, so, um, so this can, uh, it's fully biodegradable material um, and uh, it's made from glycerol and sebacic acid so the body can, can readily absorb that. Okay. Uh, does one need to suture the patch with the tissue after photo curing it? If so, how is it minimally invasive then? Right, yeah, so we, we don't need to suture the patch. Um, the example that I showed the suture was actually part of the deployment mechanism. So we had just put the suture onto the, the, the probe that we had put into the, um, you know, that was just like a proof of concept experiment, but we weren't suturing it to the tissue. It was actually just part of the, the interaction with the, the adhesive patch and the, the device. I see. What exactly was the frequency-based strategy that could help regenerate the auditory cells in, inner, in the inner ear? Yeah, so what we did is we came up with um, molecules that could activate pathways um, that could um, maintain the stemness of LGR5 um, progenitor cells and then promote their proliferation. And so we use molecules that can um, target the, the notch and the wind um, pathways. I see. About the supracrodial drug delivery, what is the difference from Professor Mark Krosnitz's work? I think he found the route to supra Crowdial first, and he has key patents on this. Speaking of your company, what is your strategy to get your own IP? Yeah, so um, yeah, so Mark started a company on this and has really made um, you know incredible progress. Um, the needle um, that they've developed is a fixed length, and so um, there's uh, differences in the thickness of the sclera. Uh, and in between, you know, in the population. And so you need to actually have multiple kind of needles to make sure that you get to the right, um, the right depth. Um, so the difference with what we developed is that our needle will automatically stop when it gets to the suprachoroidal space. So you don't have to put a needle in to determine if it's the right um, uh, depth. Uh, and, um, and so ours just automatically stops in that space, irrespective of the thickness of the, of the sclera. And um, we were able to advance a patent strategy um, so that we could have um, you know, blocking patents as well as freedom to operate. And so we have really great patent lawyers that have helped us to, to navigate that space. I see. If funding is not an issue, when is the best time to spin out a technology from the lab to a new company? What are your metrics for such a decision? So it's always a tough, um, tough, tough thing to figure out is what, you know, when, when is a good time to spin something out? And that's why I like to constantly be having conversations with people in the community. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, to me, the key is you want to be able to build a team of people um, who can help with translation, um, ideally partner with an entrepreneur um, who, um, you know, it's going to be putting in a lot of time um, and, and bringing together a much larger team. Um, and so, you know, it's different with every technology and every situation, you know, often you want to have proof of concept, um, pre really strong preclinical proof of concept. You want to have um, strong intellectual property that's filed. Um, you want to have um, ideally peer review validation, so a strong um, paper or two or more that's been, been published. 
Um, so, but there's no, it, it, it's not an easy question to answer because it's really a case by case basis. Um, but it involves a lot of conversations with people. And then also, you know, sometimes we'll have a technology <clears throat> that'll be a platform, but what we have advanced on the application may not be the best first application. So that, that's, that's actually something that, that is very challenging to figure out is what's the best first application. There's a lot of clinical and business decisions that go into what should be the first application to focus on. So often it requires conversations with lots of key opinion leaders in various fields to try to you know, discuss and, and figure out what, what to focus on. All right. Can you elaborate on the double balloon deployment in the patch technology? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so this was a system um, developed in collaboration with Connor Walsh and, and Ellen Roach. Um, and so what happened was, um, so this was a, a catheter that on the very end we had um, the patch would come out first and then behind it we had a balloon. And then there was a balloon that came out on the other side of the heart. And the balloons allowed us to apply um, force so that we could push the adhesive into the tissue so we could get intimate contact. Um, and then the um, patch is, is actually not only biodegradable and elastic, but transparent. So we shine the light into the balloon, um, but then it reflects backwards because we have a, a reflective coating on it, a metallic coating. So it reflects backwards through the patch, um, which is transparent to activate the glue, which has infiltrated the tissue. And then we pull the catheter through a very small hole that we leave behind um, in that patch. Uh, what are your thoughts about muscle-inspired bioadhesives? Do you see any potential for their translational application as bioglues? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of different um, technologies now that are being developed um, as surgical glues. And I think, um, you know, it's really difficult to answer a question that just focuses on technology, because I think what we really need to do is, is focus on the problem. So we need to think about, you know, what are the specific, um, you know, advantages or disadvantages of the technology, and then what are specific problems where this is going to be a good match. And that's one of the greatest challenges is matching the right technology with the right problem. And, and this can, you know, require like hundreds of hours of conversation to figure these things, um, these things out. So I think, um, you know, um, muscle based, um, like the, the DOPA based uh, um, adhesives are incredibly promising. And I think the key is just to really, we need to think deeply about the, the um, clinical applications as well as all these other considerations that I was referring to, to figure out what's the best applications um, to, to apply these for. All right. There have been a couple of different clues in the literature based on hydrogels. What are the, some pros and cons? Well, I think that um, hydrogels are great because you know, they, they are soft materials. Um, you can have them be uh, resorbable or biodegradable. Um, they're generally easy to work with. I think one of the challenges may be in certain dynamic environments, they can slough off, so they're hard to keep in, in a certain location or um, they can mix with blood so they can be diluted if the um, environment that you're adding, adding them to is very wet. So I think there are, you know, kind of, kind of a, a lot of different pros and cons. And I think that the pros and cons also will relate to the specific applications that we're considering. Man says, inspiring talk, thank you. What advice do you have for graduate students and postdocs who wish to explore entrepreneurship? Do you involve them as you set up your startups? Yes, actually, that's been one of the key things, I think, to you know, maximizing potential success is to have the people who were involved in the project be part of the translational process. So Maria, for example, who I mentioned, um, who co-led the adhesive work, she's now chief innovation officer at the company Tissium. Um, and uh, Nora, who I also mentioned, is now an active consultant for the company. So I think, yes, it's very important to have people who, you know, were at the lab bench and helped to develop the technologies be there um, at, during the translational process and be part of the companies if that's possible. Um, one of the reasons is, is because they're not going to let these technologies die. You know, often there's um, management decisions that can happen and, you know, they're going to fight for it because it's, it's their baby. And I think in terms of advice, I would say that 
to me, one of the greatest ways I think to gain new skills, um, including entrepreneurship skills, is to find environments where people are practicing those skills and then submerge yourself in those environments and then those skills will become your skills. I see. How many pediatric patients you treated with the balloon technique and what type of technical or clinical complications did you have? We actually haven't treated anybody yet um, with that with that technique. Um, so that remains in the laboratory because it's just a really high bar um, for from a regulatory standpoint, from a material standpoint, to be putting materials inside a beating heart of a child. So we continue to um, advance that. Um, but what we did is we took the glue component of this and we advanced that to regulatory approval in Europe. And then we're gonna be starting a trial in the US soon. Um, and now that, that material was approved for vascular reconstruction. Um, and there was a paper um, published on this, which, which is available, I'm happy to, to send that. <laughs> What is the shelf life of the PGS patches? Are they stored for long periods of time? Does the adhesive behavior deteriorate with time? Is the hydrogen bonding ability of glycerol give the adhesive behavior in parallel with the cross-linking of a Michael addition Michael of the double bond to amines found on the ECM of the tissue? Yeah, so this was actually one of the great challenges when we started the company, which was that the adhesive that we had um, developed in the laboratory, you know, we would make it and use it right away. Or we were only making it like five, 10 grams at a time. So when we started the company, we needed to be able to make, you know, hundreds of grams or, or you know, kilograms of it and have it be shelf stable for at least a year. Um, and ran into a lot of challenges to do that and had to engage a lot of consultants um, and so over time, we were able to uh, address those challenges and develop a scalable, shelf-stable um, adhesive. In terms of the mechanism of adhesion, um, we're still learning uh, about that. We do think, based on a number of experiments that we performed, that it is not a surface chemical reaction that mediates that strong level of adhesion. Rather, it's the infiltration of the adhe adhesive into tissue and the interdigitation um, with the tissue fibers and then you know curing it um, into this um, you know more rigid material that leads to mechanical interlock i see well that's all the questions we have thank you for the fascinating talk and appreciate uh, your time jeff all right thank you so much thank you everybody thank you have a great day okay thank you take care Thanks, Jeff. Bye-bye.